Welcome back to part two of this Watch Me video series where you get to watch over my shoulder as I take a real live deal in Indianapolis and I wholesale it start to finish. On this video, I'm gonna show you exactly what happened after getting the contract with the seller and how I go about finding the buyer remotely in another market coming up. For a limited time, you can get a free copy of Jerry Norton's Data Cruncher software, which finds cheap houses in your area. Get it now at mydatacruncher.com. And real quick, I wanna share a comment I received yesterday from Tom R 82 who said, hey guys, just wanted to give a shout out to Jerry's process. My first wholesale deal was an on-market deal in Chicago using his data cruncher software. Made $7,500 without even seeing the property. Bam! Hey, and congratulations, Tom R 83 that rocks. If you're new here to this channel, I'm Jerry Norton with FlippingMastery.com, and this channel is all about ways to help you make money flipping real estate so you can live your dream life. Be sure to subscribe and turn on the bell notifications so you don't miss new videos. This part two video is gonna be a longer video because there is so much I wanna share with you about the progress we've made in the past few days since securing the contract. But trust me, no one shows you and teaches like this. I received a ton of feedback and questions from the part one video about the next steps. So I'm gonna do my best to address those questions and concerns and show you hands-on with this video. So be sure to watch it all the way to the end. Now, in case you forgot, this is a deal in Indianapolis, which I've never done a deal in Indy. I live in Arizona. That means I'm doing everything from scratch, from finding the deal, analyzing it, making the offer and securing the contract, and finding a cash buyer and closing on the wholesale. I'm doing all of that in a brand new market on a deal I will never physically see in person. Now, full transparency, I've been wholesaling and flipping houses full time for 15 years and I've done hundreds of wholesale and fix and flip deals and also have experience flipping remotely in different markets. Having said that, I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm doing and explain why and what I really wanna illustrate in this entire video series is that there are proven processes and steps that apply in any market that you can learn. If you missed the first video in this video series, then you really should watch that first and then come back and watch this video. On that video, I show how I found the deal, analyzed it, and made the offer and secured the contract. I'll put a link to that video in the description box below for you. And just to do a quick recap, this is an on-market property that we currently have a contract with a seller for $50,000 with a 10-day inspection clause. And as of now, our goal is to wholesale it for $110,000. So as you can see, we've got a huge spread on this deal. Now, can we get $110,000? I don't know, time will tell. If we can, then we'll make a $60,000 wholesale fee. But even if we only get $100,000 or $90,000, this is still a home run deal. One of the recurring questions in the comments that kept coming up from video one was a lot of people thought and believe that you can't assign on market properties. Now, in case you thought that or were wondering about that, let me address it now. The only time you cannot assign a contract and would be forced to do a double closing would be if the contract specifically has a no assignment clause written in the contract. So all real estate purchase and sale contracts are assignable unless stated otherwise. It has nothing to do with the property being off market or on market or the agents or anything. I wanted to quickly address that but I do have a video that goes into more depth about the no assignment clause. I'll put a link to that video in the description. You can watch it later. With this deal in Indy, it's a private seller who hired an agent and my contract does not state that it is not assignable. So therefore it is assignable by default. So always check your contract to make sure it does not have a no assignment clause. And just so you're aware, bank properties such as REOs and short sales always have a no assignment clause. It's standard on their contracts but I created a workaround to still do a single closing using an LLC, even if the contract has a no assignment. It's a really cool hack, and I'll put a link to that video in the description box below, and you can watch it later. Okay, back to our deal. So I did video one as soon as we secured the contract, but there is a lot that happens very quickly once you get a contract from a seller. The first 10 days are critical, which I'll explain on this video, so keep watching. In my contract with the seller, I got a 10-day inspection clause with a $500 earnest money deposit. And in case you don't know, let me take a minute and explain what that means. 
a 10 day inspection clause means I have an entire 10 days to inspect the property. And if for any reason at all, I'm not happy with my discovery, I can either renegotiate with the seller or withdraw and terminate the contract and get my $500 deposit back. After the 10 days, my earnest money goes hard or becomes non-refundable. That means if I don't perform on the contract and close on the purchase, I would forfeit my $500 earnest money to the seller. And I've done deep dive videos on both earnest money and inspection clauses. So if you wanna learn more about either of those, I'll put video links in the description box below and you can watch them later. But for now, I want you to really understand the reasoning behind why I got a 10 day inspection contingency. During those 10 days, I need to accomplish two big objectives perform my due diligence and find a cash buyer. So let's start with objective number one, which is to perform my due diligence. I have 10 days to really make sure all the numbers work and I like the deal. On this deal in Indy, there were four things that I did during the first four days of the 10 day inspection. First of all, since I'm in Arizona and not there to see in person, we needed better pictures and video. Now, normally I hire a freelance videographer from Craigslist and pay like 50 bucks. I'd send him to take detailed pictures and video, but on this deal, we asked the agent who we double dipped with and he went over and did it. Now this happened on day two of our 10 day inspection. The next thing we did was we verified the square footage. This isn't normally something I do, but I was having a hard time wrapping my head around the floor plan. The listing was calling it 2,518 square feet, but since there's a basement and a second floor bungalow or loft area, and since the inside is gutted to the studs, I wanted to make sure that 2,500 square feet was accurate. So again, the agent was super helpful and we had him go and measure all the space for us. If he would have been unwilling, we would have found someone else to go and do that. Now, I'm glad we did because it's actually a little smaller than advertised and it's more like 2,330 square feet, not 2,518, so approximately 200 square feet smaller than advertised, which means we needed to adjust our numbers. Going back to the deal analyzer and Flipster, we updated our new adjusted square footage with an ARV price per square foot of $118 a foot. And that changed our original ARV sale price from 300,000 to approximately 275,000. But since it's now a smaller house, we also adjusted our rehab number from 100,000 to 80,000. And luckily it didn't really change the overall fix and flip buy number. So we left it at 110,000. Now again, 110,000 represents what a fix and flipper will pay for this deal following the standard 70% less repairs formula. This also happened on day two of the 10 day inspection window. The third thing we did as part of our due diligence during our 10 day inspection was we hired a professional inspector. Now I don't always do this, but on this deal, since it's an older home and it's gutted to the studs, we decided it was a good idea and we paid $400 for a local independent inspector. I already know it needs rehab, so we asked the inspector to just focus on making sure there weren't any major issues like structural or foundation problems. That happened on day three and he only found one issue worth noting. He couldn't find any sewer connection in the basement. Now this was alarming because a new sewer line from the house to the road could be a big expense. So we looked up a plumber in the area and he went and he took a look and discovered that it was just disconnected in the basement and not really an issue. And that happened on day four. And the fourth thing that I sometimes will do during the inspection window is get bids to do the rehab so that I can verify the rehab number and also pass on that information to any interested cash buyers. But on this deal, I felt like we have a really healthy budget of 80,000 and all the rehabs in the area are major rehabs. So all of the flippers know what their rehab numbers are. So other than the plumber looking at the sewer, I decided not to spend any time getting bids from contractors. If we were gonna fix and flip this deal, instead of wholesaling it, I would get hard bids on all of the work during the 10 day window to make sure I have the right number and the right budget for my rehab. Now, once we did all of that, we felt confident in our deal. The lesson here is to gather information and adjust accordingly. If I would have discovered something that would have changed my ability to pay 50,000 for the deal, I would go back and try to renegotiate with the seller or terminate the contract. Why? Because that's how I protect my earnest money 
in the event I discover that it's not a deal. The second major objective during the 10 days is to find a cash buyer because local active flippers in the market will tell you if you actually have a deal and what the true buy price should be. Now I have a video that explains in detail how to renegotiate your contract with sellers. I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Now keep in mind, if I had a robust list of local active cash buyers, then I'd send them my deal and I'd get it wholesaled, but I don't. I don't know one single cash buyer in that market. So if I'm gonna try and find my cash buyer during my inspection window, which I only have six days left, how do I find a cash buyer and quickly? And this brings me to a valuable lesson that I wanna share with you. A common misconception with new wholesalers is they think they have to have a cash buyer's list in order to start wholesaling deals. And it's not true. Sure, having a list of cash buyers is helpful. Sure, it would make it easier. Sure, you should always be building your list but it's not necessary. I don't need a list of cash buyers to wholesale this deal in Indy. I need a cash buyer. So let me show you my strategy to find the ideal cash buyer for our deal. And if you think about it, who would be the ideal cash buyer for our deal? If you answered a fix and flip investor who recently flipped a house in the same neighborhood, then you are dead right. All flippers love to do new deals in the same neighborhood where they previously flipped a house. That means we wanna find all of the flippers who have flipped houses in that area during the past six to 12 months. They are the ideal perfect cash buyer for our deal. There are two steps to do this, so watch over my shoulder and I'll show you how to find them. Step one is to compile a list of flip houses and we're gonna use Redfin to do that. Now there are three different lists of flip houses that we can gather. Flip homes that sold, flip homes that are currently for sale, and flip homes that are still being fixed up. And we find all of these on Redfin. Let's start with list number one, which are homes that a flipper bought, fixed up, and then resold for top market price. Now going back to Redfin, we're gonna identify and isolate our area that we wanna search. Whatever is showing on the screen in the map area is what it will search. Now make it big enough to cover the surrounding area from where your deal is. Next, put in some filters to find what we're looking for change from the for sale to sold, and then go back one year. And then let's put in a price filter so we just see the highest price flips. Let's use 250,000 as the minimum. Next, look at each one and identify which ones are flips. This is actually pretty easy. There are three things that you need to look for to know that it's a flip. One, it's rehabbed and fixed up. Two, it's vacant and three, if it's staged. Now, once we identify a flip, add the property address and the link to the listing to our list. Now, I'll show you later what we're gonna do with that list, but for now, just gather the data. After going through and gathering all of the sold flips, let's go to list number two, which is flippers who bought a home, rehabbed it, and now it's currently up for sale. So they just did it and they haven't sold it yet. Keeping the same area and price filter, let's just change from sold to for sale. Now we're looking at active listings and let's go through the list and identify which ones are flips and add those to our list. And then finally, let's go to list number three, which are flippers who recently bought a distressed home, but it isn't up for sale again, so we can assume that they're still fixing it up. So keeping the same area, let's switch it back from for sale to sold and let's go back one year, but now let's change the price. Instead of looking for flips on the resale, we wanna find them when they sold as a distressed property. So let's change the filter to the max price of 100,000. This will show us all of the homes that sold for under 100,000. Then let's go through them and make a list of the really ugly distressed homes. Okay, so now we have three different lists of recent flip houses at various stages in the area where we have our deal, but we just have the addresses. Behind every one of these homes is a cash buyer flipper. Now we could track down these flippers using a skip tracing service and try to contact them directly but that's not what I'm gonna do right now. Instead, since all of this data is on market, that means there were agents involved that were or are working with these flippers. So instead of trying to contact these flippers directly, instead we're gonna go directly to the agents that represent these flippers and offer to pay them a commission to sell our deal to their flippers. Now I do this for two reasons. Number one, it's easier to find the agents than it is to find the flippers because their info is listed right on Redfin. And I'm limited on time, so if I wanna find a buyer during my 10 days, the agents are much faster. And two, more importantly, agents are very connected to the market. If we offer to pay them, not only will they take my deal to their flippers, but they will take it to other investors that they know. 
going directly to the agents allows you to get maximum exposure on your deal very quickly. So step number two, now that we have the addresses of flip homes is to gather the agent info, which like I said, is right on Redfin. Now this is very important. We want just the agents that represented the flipper. So that means when the flipper purchased the property, we want the buyer's agent, not the listing agent. And when the flipper sold the property later, we want the listing agent and not the buyer's agent. So buyer's agent on the purchase and listing agent on the sale. These are the agents that represented the flippers and that's who we wanna to talk to. In a minute, I'm gonna to cut to some live calls I did with these agents so you can watch me and see how I do it. But before we do that, let's address one major concern that we're gonna face with our deal. Since the property was on market and listed for 50,000, the agents and flippers are gonna see that. And then when we tell them that our price is 110,000, some of them are gonna have a real issue with paying 110 when it's pending at 50,000. Technically, it shouldn't matter because 110 is a good number for a flipper to be in formula and make a profit, but I'm telling you, it does matter for some. Emotionally, they feel like they're overpaying or maybe it's not a deal or they're upset that the wholesaler is making too much money. Welcome to wholesaling. I'm bringing this up because it will be an obstacle that we'll face on this deal, especially because our spread is so big. My hope is that the right rehabber won't care about that and just look at the numbers and be fine with paying 110 since that's still a good deal. But here's my script when it comes up. The property came out for sale significantly below value at 50,000 and there were multiple offers but 110 buy with an 80K rehab on a house in a hot neighborhood with a 275K ARV is a really good deal for a flipper. And hopefully they'll look past that. But just so you know, if that does become too big of an obstacle for me to overcome with flippers, my plan B is to just close on the purchase for 50,000 and then turn around and relist it back on market for 110,000 and wait for a buyer to come along. If I do that, I'll have to fund it and it'll take longer and it'll cost me more. So I'm hoping to not have to do that, but we'll see. Stay tuned for a future video where I'll share how it actually goes down. But let's first see if we can find a buyer through the flippers agents. So step three is to contact the agents. Let's cut to a few live calls I did with these agents, but first let me explain a few positioning things that are important when talking to these agents. First, make it worth their while. I decided on this deal to offer a 5% commission if they find me a buyer for my deal. That means if they find a buyer for 100,000, they'll make a $5,000 commission, which I'd be happy to pay. Not only will they be adding value to their flipper client by bringing them a deal that they make a quick 5,000 on too, but I want them to be very motivated to work my deal to their investors. And second, be transparent. These are agents and my deal is on market. They're gonna see that it's pending for 50,000. So just tell them what you're doing and get it out of the way. In this situation, tell them you have the contract. Don't say for how much, but tell them you're trying to wholesale it so that they understand what's going on. Okay, are you ready to see it in action? I recorded an entire hour of calling agents from my list, but I'll share just a few highlights with you and then I'll come back on. I'm calling about a property that you helped an investor buy over at uh, 1806 Woodlawn a little while back. Okay. I've got a property around the corner. Is it in need of rehab? Is yeah. it finished? No, no, no. It's a big rehab. It's it. The outside's okay. pretty good shape, but the inside's gutted to the studs. Okay. My uh, thought is your buyer that bought Woodlawn might be interested since it's same neighborhood. Right. Uh, what are you looking to get out of it? 110. What's the ask? 110. And we'd pay you a commission or whatever. I, I guess I'm just calling you to see if you want to let your buyer know uh, if he's got an interest, we would take care of you. Okay. Uh, I appreciate it. I might have more than one person that could be interested in that. Yeah, so. that's what I'm hoping. We have the contract, so we've got um, a few weeks to close. So I was hoping to do an oh, assignment. Gotcha. They gotcha. step in and close. Can you text me sure. the address? I mean, the reason why I'm calling is because I see that you helped a, helped an investor buy and flip a house on Minnesota. Yes. And the house I have, I think, would be perfect for a flip. For And I'm, I'm thinking your investor might be interested. Okay. And we'd be willing to pay you a commission if you could present it to him. And if he ends up you know, buying it, then we'd, we'd be happy to pay a 5% commission. Okay. Um, and what are you asking for? 110. Sorry. We have the contract on the buy. We're looking to assign our contract. Got you. Got you. Does that make okay, sense? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Fine. We work with tons of wholesalers. If you think you've got a serious buyer, then we can get you in there. Okay. Sounds good. 
Awesome. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Kristen, we'll be in touch. Okay, so we started reaching out and marketing our deal to these agents on day five. So for the next five days, we'll call and we'll follow up with all of these agents and we'll see if we can get an interested buyer. If we do, we'll need to coordinate them to see the property and we'll need to do an assignment and then go to closing. And real quick, as I'm sure you've gathered, there are a lot of moving parts to wholesaling a deal and this is just one deal. Imagine having multiple deals going on. That's why it's critical that you organize, streamline, and automate as much of the steps as you can, and that's what my Flipster system does. I can't imagine doing this business without Flipster. If you've never heard of Flipster, it's a cloud-based, all-inclusive house flipping platform that has tools for all of the steps to finding and wholesaling and flipping deals. To check it out and see it in action, just go to getflipster.com. And help me out guys, I need your feedback. If you found a hands-on deal breakdown video like this helpful and you'd like to see more videos like this, like this video and leave a comment and let me know. I value your feedback and I would love to hear from you. And be sure to be on the lookout on my channel for part three of this video series where I'll be sharing how the deal progresses and how we find our buyer. And in the meantime, be sure to watch this next video where I show a different live deal that is a million dollar home. It's another hands-on real deal video like this one. So watch that now. And if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe. I'm dedicated to helping you make more money flipping houses so you can live your dream life. And I'll see you on the next video.